Hi, and thank you for joining us for the annual video series from the International Symposium on Human Identification. We're here with our friend Sharon, who was kind enough to join us today. She's presenting this year at Ishi. Sharon, thank you for joining us remotely. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I'm Sharon Birch McGrain. I probably should say that. And I begin every talk conversation with some truth in advertising. And I say, I am not a statistician, a scientist, or a mathematician. I come out of newspapers and reporting news for, for newspapers. And now I write non-technical books about scientists and their discoveries. So, and the book I talked about it, Ishii, that I'm talking about at Ishii, uh, is the backstory really for what many of you in Ishii do every day. You're using science to give back to society, or you, you're using Bayesian probability uh, for social justice to find the truth as, as much as we can. And the book has a long title. It's called The Theory That Would Not Die, How Bayes' Rule Cracked the Enigma Code, hunted down Russian submarines, and emerged triumphant from two centuries of controversy. How's that for a title? <laughs> I, I have to read it, it every time because it's so long. <laughs> I, I love it. And I know you wrote a wonderful article on Bayes for us for the issue report. And now it's, it's amazing to have the presentation and to go into a little bit more depth this year. Can you summarize for us what Bayes' rule is and tell us a little bit about that? Sure. It's a simple one line theorem. It's a lot shorter than the title of the book. And simply book put, uh, Bayes said you can start by assigning the probability of your initial belief about something. And then you have to multiply it over and over again with each new fact that appears, each new piece of evidence to give us a more probable, better um, probability and belief. And it was immensely controversial for a long time. It helps people make decisions based on new knowledge, but it, it, it wound up as a veritable food fight, I was told, like, like children in a lunchroom. First, Thomas Bayes himself, an English amateur mathematician said, if you don't know too much about your belief, just start with a guess. He actually used the word guess. And if you don't know even that much, just say 50-50 chance of being right, okay? But it also commits us up to this relentless updating of what we know uh, with every piece of new, new uh, data that comes up. And the second problem was that scientists in the 19th century in particular came to believe that science had to be objective and the idea of starting with a personal belief was appalling. They called it ignorance coined into science. They said it smacked of astrology and alchemy. And be, they said you had to judge the probability of a future event only uh, on the number of times the event had occurred in the past. Nowadays, you pick and choose the method that's best for the problem you have, but, but they're saying, no, gotta, gotta do it by the numbers. Wonderful. Yes, it absolutely does. I mean, I, I really liked in your article when you were talking about how Bayes gets to the heart of like the fundamental issue, how do we analyze information and come to a decision? And I know you told some very interesting stories that included Alan Turing. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Um, what I discovered researching Bayes, uh, the history of Bayes was that it operated for a long time, for more than a hundred years on two levels. The first was this one by statistics, university uh, statisticians uh, that said it has to be frequentism based only on the number of times it's, it's, been, uh, it's happened before. But the other one was that real life people who had to make emergency decisions, who couldn't wait for all the knowledge in the world to be accumulated, who had to make often life and death decisions, they kept right on using Bayes, often in secret, because Bayes helped them make do with what they had, basically. 
So you had insurance actuaries setting the next year's premium rates. You had before DNA, there were lawyers who used bays and paternity suits. And armies, um, particularly in, uh, in Britain and France and Russia and the United States, used bays to, to aim their fire, their artillery, uh, and to test their weapons and um, ammunition. So it was also used in courtrooms more than 100 years ago. It helped free Alfred Dreyfus, who was a French Jew, was one of the top generals in the French army in the 1890s. And he was falsely accused uh, by anti-Semites of forging a document and getting it to the enemy. And in the scandal that rocked France split it in two, but also much of the Western world. Dreyfus was actually, he was found guilty of treason. And there was actually a military ceremony in which he stood and they physically ripped off his, his rank and all of his medals. And he was sentenced to life imprisonment at hard labor. Now Dreyfus's lawyer, family organized a lawyer, asked France's top mathematician, Poincaré, who was at the Sorbonne, whether he thought Dreyfus had forged that document. And he wrote, he actually preferred frequency-based uh, statistics, but he wrote the court that he considered Bayes' rule the only sensible way for a court of law to update a hypothesis with new evidence. And the courtroom erupted into cheers. <laughs> um, it was a military court. All the judges and the lawyers had studied Bayes in military textbooks and military schools. And they understood what Poincaré was talking about. So in this respect, Dreyfus had an advantage over many of the Ishi members who have to explain their situations to a jury that hasn't the foggiest notion of what, it, what, what they're talking about, okay? They understood what Poincaré was saying. And a few likes, weeks later, Dreyfus was pardoned. But you asked about Alan Turing because that involved a, another courtroom. By the time the Second World War um, started in 1939, Bayes was basically taboo. But during the war, England was cut off from the French farms and factories that had kept it supplied. And England could feed only one in three of its residents. And it depended on convoys of unarmed merchant marine ships, bringing food and supplies from Africa, picking them up uh, in South America and going up through the Caribbean and the United States and Canada, and then forming huge convoys of delivering 30 million tons of food and supplies every single year to, to England. And the German U-boats were so effective that they would sink almost 3,000 Allied ships and kill uh, more than 50,000 merchant marine seamen. Hitler said you boats will win the war. Churchill said the only thing that worried him during the war that scared him were those U boats. They were ordered around to get at the convoys uh, by encrypted uh, messages that were radioed to the, to the U boats in the, in the Atlantic. And these messages were encrypted with word scrambling, uh, by word scrambling machines, really. They're called enigmas. And they could churn out millions upon millions of permutations within hours. And neither the Germans or the British ever thought the British would be able to read those encrypted messages to the U-boats. Fortunately for the British, Alan Turing was not a statistician. He was a mathematician. And when war was declared, uh, he goes the next morning up to the secret English coding and decoding headquarters uh, at Bletchley Park, just north of London. He was 27, but he looked 16. He was handsome, athletic, shy, nervous. 
and during college at Cambridge, he had lived openly as a homosexual. He gets to Bletchley Park and they begin collecting whispers of clues as to what the words going to the U-boats might mean. They knew, of course, the pro most probable letter combinations in the German language. And a prisoner of war told uh, them that Enigma operators um, spelled out all the numbers. So they knew the word for one, E-I-N, Ein, uh, and an article like A -E or M uh, would, be, would appear in the 90% of the messages. Then, these were my favorites. The Germans had stationed uh, weather boats across the top of the Atlantic, and they were to report each night what the weather had been and what it should be by the time it arrives in, your, in the continent. And um, weather doesn't have a wildly uh, descriptive vocabulary, so they repeated the same words of, 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 you know, in, in different coded messages uh, night after night, and that was an enormous help. And Turing soon develops a very Bayesian system, pencil and paper, that let him guess a stretch of letters in the original German message to the U-boats, and he could hedge his bets, measure his belief in their validity by assessing their probabilities, and add more clues as they arrived. And within a year and a half, Turing could read those U-boat messages within an hour of their arrival at Bletchley Park. They could reroute the convoys and avoid the U-boats. Not a one was attacked during that time. Then the German army came up with a super sophisticated system and Bayes' system were embedded into the computers that the British were developing to break those codes. But the Tur so Turing was just this enormous hero and it might well be that without Turing, England might not have, have survived the war. So the Turing story ends with a, with a real tragedy because during the Cold War, the secrecy after the World War II, Turing was not recognized anywhere for his work. And a local court convicted him for homosexuality in his own home with a consenting adult and sentenced him to chemical castration. And he ultimately commits suicide. It's, it's a terrible story. Uh, the Cold War, of course, continued this fight between the Bayesians and their opponents, and the public's sheer ignorance of statistics and Bayes hand it was a big handicap for the maybe a hundred Bayesian believers, which, as I said before, Ishii members may have experienced themselves in the courtrooms. And there was another very sad uh, case involving a young mother, a young lawyer, as a matter of fact, in England named Sally Clark. During the late 1990s, quite recently, in terms of history, uh, British mothers were being arrested for murder and sentenced to life imprisonment if two or more of their babies died in their cribs. For example, Sally Clark's this little boy, his son had died at 11 weeks. Uh, she got pregnant, had another boy, and he died when he was eight weeks old and was convicted of murder in 1999. The court had asked a prominent pediatrician, not, not a statistician nor a mathematician, uh, but a pediatrician to state the odds of those children dying naturally. He said it's simple, it'd be one in 73 million. So naturally, she obviously she had murdered her children. And she was sentenced to prison. The pediatrician had assumed incorrectly that each sibling's death occurred independently of the other. If they had used Bayes, that would have brought out the fact that some families like Sally Clark's are predisposed to either environmentally or genetically to SIDS or crib death. 
there was an uproar among statisticians. They petitioned the courts, the parliament, the newspaper articles, so on, speeches, and nothing of the court said base does not belong in the courtroom. And it was medical reports uh, that later freed her. But the whole experience was so devastating, destroying, that uh, she dies two, three, day, three years after being freed from prison. Uh, she died of acute alcohol intoxication. So it was not good. Yeah, so okay. using good statistics is, is very important. Right, I think we took for granted how important something like that is. Yes, exactly. exactly. How did you get involved in the work that you're doing? It's so fascinating. How did I what? Get involved in the work that you're doing. Oh, well, uh, I was in newspapers first. Is that what you mean, how I came to do this? Yes, that'd be great. Yes, that'd be great. Yeah, well, I had been in newspapers and so on, and when the industry began, crumbling and it was really impossible to write anything serious anymore. Um, I switched to a lot of reporters wanted to, to do, which is to write, write books. <laughs> and I really like putting the puzzles together uh, of science, a scientific problem, and then the evidence comes in. It's a very Bayesian process and you put it all together and then it's done by interesting people. So that's what that's, I like. It's wonderful. I, the stories are incredible. I mean, you, you don't think about, um, you know, we talk about these statistical theorems, but we don't think about all the stories that brought them to where they are today. What's it like when you're researching and writing? What is the, I'd love to hear about the process. It involved, a, uh, well, I had to read the original papers and find them. A lot of Bayesians didn't even know about some of these stories. But I felt as if I were walking through a fruit orchard and there were these juicy, gorgeous plums and oranges and things all around. And I could just pull them down. Every one of them would be one of these fabulous stories. <laughs> so that part of it was very nice. Yeah. But I'm thinking about how um, Bayes, the whole game changed very quickly in the late 1990s. Um, cheaper desktop computers came on. There were uh, Markov chain, Monte Carlo techniques, free off-the-shelf Bayesian software. And all of a sudden, Bayes could be used to solve complex problems because it was so powerful and so complex. And it really went overnight. Nobody changed their opinions on the philosophy of Bayes. It was just, it works, man. <laughs> right, what a turnaround, that's amazing. Yeah, it is such a fascinating story. Um, were there any surprises while you were writing? It's certainly filled with twists and turns. <laughs> well, I, in the beginning, I got involved in the food fight. <laughs> Because I would call statisticians and ask for help. Have what I've written, is it accurate? You know, what else should I write about it? What blah, blah, blah. And um, often they said, no, we won't help you. And the other thing that happened was some of them would get very, very angry. And one man screamed into the telephone so loud I had to put the phone receiver out as far as my arm would go and hold it there. He said, Bayes, it's awful, it's stupid, it's dangerous, and your book will be stupid and awful and dangerous. And he was like an opera singer. He just went on and on without taking any breath and screaming over the phone. And when he paused for a breath, I said, thank you very much for your help, goodbye. I think that was probably the right answer. That's yeah. More, but it did until 15, 10, 15 years ago. Um, well, I know that's not the only the work that you've done. Uh, you also have written about uh, Nobel Prize winning women. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, sure. Um, I, I wrote a book called Nobel Prize Women in Science. Um, before the onslaught of 
women's studies and so on, and particularly women in science, the problems they had. Um, and it was about 20 years ago. And most of these women, 15 of them that I found who either contributed in a very important way to someone else's prize or won the prize themselves. Uh, there were 15 of them and I profiled each and so on. And almost all of them were still alive because I was doing this a while back. So even with the Marie Curie, I could talk to the daughter who had written the famous book about her that turned so many women onto science. Uh, Rosalind Franklin, I was, had died of cancer, but uh, I could talk to all of, all of the members of her laboratory. And the way they described Rosalind Franklin was totally different from James Watson's description in his book. So on. So. That is fascinating. Any, um, any surprises when you were talking with Marie Curie's daughter or, or the uh, associates of Rosalind Franklin? I, I just think people would be so interested to know what that was like, what an opportunity. People told me when I, I explained you know, at a friend or a party or something, what I was doing, the universal uh, assumption was that every woman in science was blah, gray, uninteresting. They were all alike. And what I found that every single one of them was different. They were all fabulous. They loved what they were doing. And they were, they were very, there wasn't anyone who was a, uh, like another. They were all different. Some were mountain climbers, some were um, couturiers for their clothing, and fashionable cooks, and, and, and so on. It was, they were all just fabulous. And the people who knew about them weren't in science for uh, profit, either career-wise or, or um, And they they were in it because they knew these women and had supported them because they they believed in the science. So they were nice too. It, it was a great it was great fun. That sounds wonderful. And I understand you're working on another project that sounds just as fascinating. Um, I believe you mentioned something with uh, Rita Caldwell. Yes, yes, that's a book that's just recently been published and just recently came out in paperback, much cheaper. Um, she was the first woman to direct the National Science Foundation, the only microbiologist. Um, and it's called, long title again, A Lab of One's Own, One Woman's Personal Germany, Journey Through Sexism in Science. And I co-authored that with Rita Caldwell. I started writing a, a book about the revolution in biology from hip book, ooh, stuff and test tubes and so on, to the use of Bayes' rule, very mathematical, statistical uh, in, in biology. But it wound up to be a story of discrimination that women faced and still faced and what they could do about it, what we can do about it, don't comment. I love the topic. What draws you to women in science? How did that begin? What, what drew me to it? Well, I knew, um, from my own children's high school that the only girls that took calculus which you need for science um, were in the classrooms for calculus classrooms because their fathers were physicists and in, demanded that their children their daughters take it and i thought that was so strange it was during a period when uh, the media and the uh, government so on was going crazy saying we don't have as many scientists or um, engineers as the Japanese do and we'll never catch up. And so I thought, well, this is a simple solution. You get the sisters of all the brothers who go into science and they go into science. So I'll write about other women um, and that'll be a simple solution. That was 20 years ago and we're still, still working on the problem. Well, I hate that we're working on the problem, but I love that you're writing about it and bringing it to light. And I love to see the progress in that area too. I know it's something that we celebrate here and having you speak is, is part of that. What's next for you? I don't know. I'm looking for a topic. And if some of the 
members of Ishi have some ideas for me, it would be very kind of them to slip me a message. And I would wish all of them thanks for inviting me, but also very, very good luck in the future in their lives and their careers. So, well, thank you, Sharon. That is lovely. I, I bet you are going to get some great suggestions from this audience. And we so appreciate you being with us and being willing to do this with us remotely today, too. Well, that was very nice. Thank you.